afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Rosen Wartell, and I have the great honor and pleasure of being the president of the Urban Institute and also of uh, being able to uh, welcome you all to today's conversation. We have people joining us from all across the country. Um, I'm sorry we're not in person, uh, but uh, really excited that we're going to have a chance to talk today about our collective understanding of how much our rural communities have to offer. So first, we have a few housekeeping notes. Um, I have to say the event is being recorded. We've heard this a few times now. The recording and relevant links will be posted online after the event on the event page. Live captions are turned on, but if you find them distracting, you can turn them off by visiting the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. All participants are muted, but we really welcome you typing your questions or comments into the questions box at any time, or you can email them to events at urban.org if you're watching live and we'll see if we can bring them into the conversation later. We'll be sharing a link to a post event survey and we ask you to give us your feedback because it's really helpful for us and the panelists to hear what you're thinking about and it really shapes what we do in the future. And if you would like to join the conversation on Twitter, we encourage you to use the hashtag live at urban so that you can join with others also in the event. So I raced back to get back to my office today because I just left the US Treasury Department where the Vice President, uh, um, Vice President Harris and Secretary Yeltsin announced $9 billion in capital investments in minority and CDFI depository institutions. And I spoke a little bit about another urban report that was released today uh, called A New Era of Racial Equity in Community Development Finance that was talking about the private and philanthropic commitments in the post George Floyd period and putting the public and private and philanthropic investments together. How can we use that to create growth in our communities? Um, after we had this really unprecedented commitment. Um, and we tried to talk in that report about how to better align these commitments to need and sustain them over time. But the reason I mention this here is because I spoke there about the importance of looking for the assets in these communities, whether they're rural, urban, or suburban, and understanding how investment can unleash potential and grow opportunity. So it's great that I wanted desperately to come back here to be able to say welcome to this fabulous discussion of how we can particularly leverage the assets that we have um, in rural communities through strategic investments and how data and tools like the new typology and dashboard that we are gonna talk about today can help to do that. As you guys know who are tuning in probably better than many, there is no single rural America. But the definitions of these areas often lump them together as something that's not urban. And we too often describe them in the negative too, by what they lack rather than what they are rich in. So my colleagues here have been focusing on the fact that although rural communities face many challenges, as most communities across the country do, they are often rich in underappreciated resources, diversity, and potential. By better understanding the strengths, policymakers from the Treasury Building to the USDA at the local level, state, community, county, et cetera, along with practitioners and investors, can build on the community's potential by better targeting investments and support. So today's conversation is going to offer a demonstration of this typology and this dashboard tool that my colleagues have worked on, featuring national data on rural census tracts and peer groups. These data, it was work to put this together. These data were carefully assembled and interpreted, not just by folks at Urban, but with the help of diverse rural stakeholders who could help us to highlight and understand the range of assets from community facilities and services, civic and cultural institutions and public infrastructure, the natural resources, financial capacity, and so much more that exists in these communities all with the goal of supporting asset-based rural investments and capacity building. After the demonstration of this tool, we're gonna to hear from a panel of rural practitioners and policy experts talking about the opportunities and challenges of identifying and showcasing rural assets. They also tell us why using an asset-based investment framework matters for the work they do on rural policy and work with rural communities and how local leadership and data tools can help. 
Before I turn this over to our terrific keynote uh, opening here, I want to do some acknowledgments. Um, my colleague we'll hear from in a little bit, Corey Ann Scali, has uh, been our leader in developing this tool, but just as much she has been a leader at Urban on advancing our work about rural places and their people. A big thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation who helped to support this project. And a special thanks to our partners at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors and the USDA Rural Development Team for their expert guidance and feedback on data, methodology, and tool development. But before we get to the tool and the panel, I wanna introduce Sochil torres Spall, Undersecretary for Rural Development at USDA. Before coming to rural development, Undersecretary Torres Small was a U.S. Uh, representative from New Mexico's second congressional district, which is actually the fifth largest district in the country, and which she was the first woman and first person of color to represent this ginormous community. The Undersecretary has been a longtime champion of rural communities. In the midst of the COVID crisis, she kept a rural hospital, if only we were done with it. <laughs> At the heat of the COVID crisis, she helped to keep a rural hospital from closing its doors. She improved constituent access to healthcare over the phone and helped secure millions of dollars for broadband in New Mexico through USDA's ReConnect program. And prior, prior to the pandemic, Undersecretary Torres Small raised the alarm on broadband disparities, serving on Majority Whip Jim Clyburn's Rural Broadband Task Force. And she was an original co-sponsor of the Accessible Affordable Internet for All Act. After we hear some, I think, opening inspiring remarks from her, we'll be joined by Kari Ann, who, as I mentioned, is a principal research associate in Urban's own Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center. Her work at Urban explores the design, implementation, and outcomes of affordable housing and community development policy and programs for vulnerable populations across urban communities with a special focus on rural ones. So please join me in welcoming the Undersecretary and then uh, Corey Ann will take it from there. And I hope you find this helpful. Please give us your feedback. Thanks. Sarah, thank you so much. It is an honor and a joy to get to be here with all of you today uh, to kick off such an important event. I wanna start by congratulating you on the launch of your new typology and dashboard. I'm so grateful that my colleagues in rural development were able to help with the development of this crucial tool uh, that sees rural America for what it really is, for its diversity. Because yes, rural America is sometimes that guy or, or gal on a tractor, but it's also so much more than that. It's the people picking the crops, it's Indian country, it's tourism, it's hunting and wilderness, and it's so much more. I also love that your dashboard looks at rural America the way I do, through a lens of strengths of each unique community. Now, all of us come to this work for a reason. I certainly do. And for me, that reason has come from opportunities and decision points that have made up my path so far. Uh, that path starts with my grandparents uh, who immigrated from Mexico uh, to the Mesilla Valley, where I now still call home, uh, to pick cotton in the fields. And that opportunity grounded in rural communities uh, is what gave them the chance to raise a family, to build their first home, uh, which was a dwelling right near that field with a dirt floor and an outhouse, and then build another home, uh, which my parents actually still live in today. It was those opportunities that gave me the chance uh, to get to grow up in the Mesilla Valley and also gave me the decision point that ultimately uh, allowed me to come back and rural, work on rural development. That decision point started uh, actually growing up in the Mesilla Valley and wanting to get out, wanting to go anywhere else. And that led me uh, first to Eswatini in Southern Africa and then to Washington DC to study international development. In studying international development, I realized early on that the opportunities and the successes that come aren't defined by who the funder is or how much money is spent, but more by who their partners on the ground are, more by the people invested in their own futures who then are empowered by those investments. That's what caused me to come back home and ultimately get the chance to get to represent my home in the United States, in the United States Congress. And now I get to take those lessons that New Mexico taught me and come to rural development at this incredibly exciting time. 
I get to lead a mission area that works every single day with people on the ground. And I'm coming to the table at a time when practitioners and stakeholders like yourselves are championing place-based regional approaches. I don't have to tell you, but that place-based focus matters. For rural development, it's the difference between having to walk into a bank, maybe borrowing a suit and putting together a portfolio to justify that you deserve a loan, compared to having your neighbor knock on your door and say, hey friend, uh, I see that you're working on this cool project. Do you wanna borrow any of my tools? That place-based focus also returns power to the assets people have rather than the needs that others access or ascribe. It's the difference between talking to uh, someone from a city who wants to talk about all the reasons why rural America is declining versus talking to someone who lives in rural America, who wants to build a better future for their kid. It's crucial that we invest in that rural parent's vision because it's the people on the front lines of today's challenges who we're counting on to be on the forefront of forging solutions. That's true when it comes to climate smart energy infrastructure. That's true when it comes to expanding markets to, supply, to solve the supply chain. And it's true when it comes to equity, whether that's making sure that no one in Indian country has to haul their own water, or whether it's making sure that no one in Alaska has to use an outhouse, or whether it's making sure that no kid in rural America feels like they're worthless because they have to do their homework from a parking lot. Every one of those stories is about equity. Your new typology and dashboard fits perfectly with the assets approach. It's a tool that helps us identify what best serves our neighbor and what investments will improve a community so that as people often say, my kid wants to stay here. Lenders tell me that they evaluate not just an applicant's plan, but the ecosystem around that person. The importance of the ecosystem is why we need your powerful new typology and dashboard and why we need people on the ground. As, as you discussed today, I'm excited about the work that's being done and I'm excited about the work that rural development can add to it. Specifically, I'm very excited about the Rural Partnership Program, which is asset focused, investing in people and local capacity on the ground. There's a lot of important work being done to develop that, and I'm eager to get to work with all of you to continue that. We have a shared passion for locally driven solutions. I'm excited to work with you on a focus while focusing on assets, local expertise, and sharing best practices. And if something isn't working or if it could work better, I look forward to working with you and you letting us know because we can't solve problems we don't know about. Thank you again for having me here today and for your important work on behalf of communities in need. Thank you so much, Undersecretary, for sharing your vision with us on asset-based rural development. Um, we really appreciate you and everything that um, you and your team do to elevate rural people and places uh, through a focus on asset building and local expertise. So thank you so much for taking time to be with us today and for your comments. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, as uh, Sarah mentioned, my name is Corianne Scally, and I'm a senior researcher in our Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center here at Urban, uh, with a focus on affordable housing and community development policy and practice um, in urban areas uh, down to small rural towns. And I'm really happy to be speaking with you today. Um, in addition to thanking the Undersecretary for her comments, I'd like to add my thanks to our project partners um, at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors and USDA Rural Development um, and our stakeholder advisory groups. Uh, and finally, to thank my team at Urban for their hard work over the past two years to make this project a reality. This project started with a desire to fill a gap in existing data tools on rural people and places. Instead of pointing to deficits or what is wrong, we wanted to highlight strengths that can be leveraged through strategic investments. And we also wanted to be as inclusive of all rural communities as possible, which meant finding good data at a smaller geography than county. 
So with our partners, we chose to look at inhabited rural census tracts identified by the USDA Economic Research Services Rural Urban Commuting Area Codes. Using an asset-based approach, we've identified seven peer groups across the nation that can be used to explore opportunities for both new and expanded rural investments and support such as technical assistance. Our hope is that this tool and its underlying data can be used to leverage assets, including those that are currently underappreciated and advance equity for rural communities across the country. Before we explore some of the peer groups together, I'd like to briefly outline the asset-based approach that we use to select measures and to create this typology. We built upon the community capitals framework developed by Flora and Flora, leading rural sociologists. And they posit seven types of capitals that communities can leverage for growth and development. And we worked with our partners and rural stakeholders to associate a set of measures with each of these community capitals. So built capital includes important infrastructure from access to housing, to transportation, to communications and emergency services. Cultural capital encompasses the fabric of community life, including the diversity of languages, religions, races and ethnicities in the community, as well as the presence of cultural institutions and organizations. Financial capital looks at wealth, like home values, and the availability of financial resources, such as investments from federal resources, as well as community development financial institutions. Um, and then finally, other financial institutions, such as banks and credit unions. Human capital focuses on opportunities and access to health, education, and training, and jobs. Natural capital includes resources in the natural environment that shapes a region's identity, its industry, and its culture, including crop coverage, park coverage, and access to oil and natural gas. Political capital focuses on the level of influence that a community has over policy through its participation in democratic processes and governance, including things like participation in elections, local employment within government, and Census Bureau survey participation. And finally, social capital looks at the level of interconnectedness within a community through its civic and social organizations, places of worship, um, and community institutions such as libraries and schools that serve as gathering places. In total, we selected 50 measures available through public data sets that have good coverage across all rural census tracts in the United States to operationalize this framework and create our typology. In addition, since we acknowledge the importance of institutional contexts um, for helping to leverage assets, we compiled and report data on local government and other support networks like Chambers of Commerce, United Way affiliates, and federal regional commissions that can all be strategic partners in this work. <clears throat> So one primary use for this tool is understanding the peer groups. And these peer groups were created using statistical processes to maximize the similarities within each group. The dynamic typology map that you see here allows you to see all peer groups at the same time. Um, but you can also select an individual peer group to explore separately via the drop-down menu on the right, um, which lists peer groups uh, by size, um, ranging from the group with the largest number of census tracts in it to the group with the fewest tracts. When looking at all peer groups together, you can scroll down and see how they compare across all 50 typology measures, which are organized below the map according to each of the seven community capitals. So for example, you see here the data used for built capital, um, which are nine different measures including broadband, emergency medical services, affordable housing, and transportation infrastructure. Looking at our measure for broadband access shows that on average, tracks in the centers of wealth and health group indicated by the yellow bar have a higher proportion of households with broadband or cellular data, data subscriptions than tracks within the diverse institution rich hubs peer group that's indicated by the pink bar at the bottom of the list. 
If we scroll down to view other measures, we see low shares of federal subsidized housing units across all peer groups, but slightly higher shares on average for the high employment agricultural areas at the top of the list in green and in the diverse institution rich hubs peer group, again indicated in pink. Not all measures varied substantially across peer groups, however. So we can see, for example, how averages for cell service coverage and housing quality are fairly similar across all peer groups. However, when we look at individual census tracts in a moment, you will see that there can still be variety within peer groups. If we go back to the map and select an individual peer group, we'll find the peer group description, which includes both assets and challenges. High employment agricultural areas include census tracts with the highest average share of land area covered in crops, and also have high unemployment rates and strong access to health supports. To present a balanced view of each group, we also list, list challenges based on what a peer group scored lowest on, on average, compared with the other six peer groups. So for this group, challenges include low financial capacity among social welfare organizations, as well as the lowest access to child care centers. <clears throat> Looking at another peer group, Centers of Wealth and Health scored high across many measures of income, education, and health, and did not have any notable challenges, scoring around average across all other measures included in our typology. And the last group we'll highlight for you today is the diverse institution um, rich hubs, which are racially and ethnically diverse with strong access to community institutions and health facilities. These tracks also have the highest average amount of community development investments. And an average tract in this group is around 10% tribal land. In terms of challenges, however, there are significant ones, including low labor force participation and life expectancy, the worst air quality, and the lowest share of households with access to broadband or a cellular data subscription. To explore each peer group, you can navigate via the MAPS drop-down menu, as discussed earlier, um, and see the group descriptions there. But you can also scroll down to a specific community capital of interest and select a peer group there. Uh, either way, you'll note that the data displayed now um, reflect the selected peer group and compare this group to all rural census tracts taken together. For example, here we explore the data on financial capital for the Centers of Wealth and Health peer group. And we can visually see how this peer group scores better on average across all of the financial measures than com when compared to all rural census tracts taken together. So tracts in this group have better access to banks and credit unions, receive larger average investments, and have higher home values and individual income. In addition to exploring national peer groups, Another key use of this tool is for viewing and using the data for each inhabited rural census tract in the country. The map enables you to zoom in on an area of your choice and select an individual census tract. When you select a tract, the right hand text will confirm the tract number for you and show you the county and state. It will also show additional data on local government structures and support networks that can be leveraged for asset building. The data displays below also change to show the census tract value for each measure in addition to its peer group average and the total rural average. To demonstrate briefly, this is one of two census tracts designated as rural in Peach County, Central Georgia by the USDA Economic Research Service. It is located southwest of Fort Valley, the county seat. It is also close to Fort Valley State University, which is an 1890 land grant historically black university that enrolls around 2,800 students and is represented today by one of our panelists. And to the right of the map, we see that there is a regional government network here, a local United Way affiliate and two chambers of commerce that serve communities in this census tract. <clears throat> 
If we scroll down to our data below and take a look at the cultural capital measures, we now see a comparison of the census tract measure in pink to the peer group average also in pink to the average across all inhabited rural census tracts shown here by the black bar uh, at the bottom of each chart. We see that compared to its peer group, this tract has lower cultural organizational revenues and cultural employment, but it does score higher on access to convention centers, historic properties, racial and ethnic diversity and religious diversity than both its peer group and the rural average. Excuse me. And finally, for those who want to know more about how we prepared and analyzed the data for this typology, we have some notes at the bottom of the tool with a link to our full technical appendices. And the full data set for all inhabited rural census tracts is also available for free download, along with the data dictionary to help you interpret each measure that we used. <clears throat> It's been my privilege to give you an overview of our typology and dashboard today. If you've already had an opportunity to take a closer look, we'd love to hear what you think and if and how you've used it so far. We're dropping a link into the chat that will take you to a brief survey so that you can share your thoughts with us. If you haven't yet had an opportunity or you're wondering how others are thinking about using this tool, how it might help and what its limits are, I'm very pleased to be turning things over to our panel moderator, Andrew Dumont, to lead an in-depth discussion with our esteemed panelists. Andrew is a community development analyst at the Federal Reserve Board, where he leads the board's work on rural development, affordable housing, and other place conscious community and economic development policy areas. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us today to lead this conversation. Thank you for that introduction, Corianne, and for the invitation to moderate this panel of esteemed rural development experts. Uh, and thank you for, and your team for putting this project together. Um, I'll just invite my uh, other panelists to uh, join me on screen here. Um, and again, I'm Andrew Dumont with the Federal Reserve Board where I lead our work on rural development. And we have with us for this discussion today, uh, Heidi Kokar, the Executive Director of Rural Development Initiatives in Oregon. Uh, Joey Moten Thomas, the Assistant Administrator for Community Development and Outreach for the College of Agricultural, Family Sciences and Technology at Fort Valley State University in Georgia. Uh, and I'm just gonna apologize if I'm butchering any of your names, uh, please, uh, I beg your forgiveness. Um, and uh, Jana uh, Topolsky, uh, the soon to be retired uh, executive director of the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group uh, located in Washington, DC, uh, but serving primarily rural communities across the country. I wanna thank you all uh, for taking the time to be uh, with us here today for this important conversation. Uh, and just a quick note for our audience before we get started. Uh, we will be taking audience Q&A uh, for the last 15 minutes of the session. Uh, so please enter your questions into the Q&A box in Zoom, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. I imagine many of us are uh, old hands at these meetings uh, at this point, but um, as I understand it, the chat box is not available, but the Q&A box is, uh, and that uh, we'll be fielding those questions uh, again at the, in the last 15 minutes of our session. So uh, please. Uh, enter them. We're very interested in your questions and comments. Uh, we're not just saying that, so uh, be part of the discussion. So um, uh, now on to our panel discussion. So as uh, Sarah and Corianne mentioned earlier, uh, the team at Urban asked uh, each of us to participate in this conversation today uh, so we could explore the potential for asset-based rural investment and capacity building as well as how the tool that Corey Ann just walked us through, uh, how that can help contribute to a rural investment that is better aligned with and better leverages the assets present in rural communities. Now I'm gonna pose this uh, to all of you, uh, all my panelists here. Uh, since this tool and this conversation are fundamentally about rural assets, 
I want to start by asking you all what may sound like a pretty basic question, uh, but I think is critical to highlight and sort of set as the baseline for our conversation today. And that is, what important undervalued assets exist in rural communities that our listeners should know about and are worth investing in? Uh, Joy, uh, I'll start out with you, and we'll turn to Heidi, and we'll wrap up uh, this question with Janet. So, uh, Joy? Thank you, Andrew, for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to uh, engaging in this wonderful dialogue with my colleagues and just curious of what their responses are gonna be. But the first two things that came to my mind are um, uh, physical uh, assets, such as like buildings, the infrastructure that's in there in, in our rural communities. And then also, and I don't wanna take from anybody else, the people. Um, I think that's why we all get up and do what we do every day is because of the people who we serve and we love doing it. And we see this as an opportunity to make a difference in the lives of the people that we serve. And I don't wanna steal uh, or plagiarize what the undersecretary said, but it's about time that we focus on the good things that rural America has to offer. So I'm gonna keep my response short and I'm gonna let my other colleagues respond as well. It is about time. Um, I. Uh... I think it's really easy for us to see and value some of the assets in rural, particularly in the category of natural, right? We think of those in kind of in their inherent value and in nature and the, also the ways that we as humans need them, we use them, even we extract them for our energy, our food, our materials and recreation. But we had already, I actually focus on um, some capitals that we call foundational capitals here in our work. Um, and those um, are slightly different than um, some of the ones that even Joy mentioned, though the human one is the number one I will put forward. Um, human capital um, and just the number of people. And when we think of it at RDI, we think of it as the number of people who are actively involved in creating change in their communities. And so this is a capital that's um, it's low in rural, right? That just almost by definition, um, but it is one that's very important to watch and to and that it is undervalued. I was once having a cup of coffee with a woman in um, Harney County, which is home of the Malheur National Refuge. Um, for any of those who need some context. And it was, um, she said, we just need 150 more people here, right? Like we just need 150 more folks. Um, the second one I would just mention as a, a foundational one is social capital and the, the intersection world is tight knit. And so that the connections between each other and the trust, kind of the trust bank, the reciprocity bank um, that is built in rural communities, I would say. And the other two that are up there for us are intellectual, which isn't mentioned here that we use it at RDI um, and political capital intellectual and is our know-how, particularly as it relates to what is our assets? Um, what is our competitive advantage? What are the networks and best practices that it takes to keep and move a rural community going? So information, information is, is a, I would say trusted information sources and trusted knowledge is something that I think is, uh, I don't wanna say it's rare, but it's, it's highly valued when it's trusted. So that's what I will mention. Oh, can I say one more because I think it's really cute. I think uh, cups of coffee in rural places are undervalued. I can go buy a, a $2 cup of coffee in a rural place and just so you know, it's not guaranteed it's gonna be there, but it's like $9.50, uh, $10 in urban. And I'm like, why the difference is actually more valuable in a rural place because I'm not sure I'm gonna get it. So cups of coffee, I'm gonna add it. Not only that, the half and half or the cream is so much better. You know, <laughs> the local dairy. Local dairy. <laughs> undervalued, well, I think actually it is undervalued, but if you're there, you really value it. Um, uh, let, let me add a few things. Uh, you know, when, when I look again at, and I, I wanna thank the Urban Institute for doing this, the, the, I was looking again at the, the tool this morning and the, the background stuff, the appendixes. And, you know, when Flora and Flora put together the community capital framework uh, originally, which has then been adapted and expanded in other places or, or, or used like in, in WealthWorks, which is what Heidi was referring to. They define it as resources, right? Assets. What are, what, what are capitals or assets? They're resources 
that can be invested or tapped for the purpose of promoting the long-term well-being of communities. So when we think about what is undervalued or underutilized in that, I think of several things. Okay, I also think about people, but I think about it as people as doers, leaders, system analyzers, analyzers and innovators. You know, when you think a lot of the, the, the policy supports for rural people, it has more to do with bucking up, you know, like basic needs. And it has to do with really investing in people to do what they know needs to be done in those rural places. So, uh, you know, and I, I see another underutilized or underappreciated, undervalued asset is what I would call the glue organizations that make things happen. And, and I think that uh, Corian and company were able to measure the existence of certain, certain you know, social organizations or so, social service organizations or whatever, but they're organizations and then they're organizations. So the asset is who's bringing the place together you know, within a region to do analysis of the region and, and I, I totally love the line in Urban's um, presentation that rural places are more than their needs. That's absolutely the case. Rural places are their assets, but who's bringing everyone together to analyze it? You can't do it town, you can do it town by town, but for action to take place or to tap resources or leverage resources from investors within and outside the community, you really have to look at broader than community by community. So the organizations or groups that do that work, that glue work are, are really not measured or, or analyzed enough. And I mean, the one other thing I would say that is often undervalued is I would say the unexpected entrepreneurs, right? I, and even the businesses that exist, I mean, People don't think of rural business as innovators. People don't think of rural businesses as investable. And they are so wrong, <laughs> you know, and I think we've learned that some of that over the last year through the, you know, PPP loans were not getting to rural places. Then finally, you know, more money got to CDFIs that were able to get into more rural businesses and they're vital in their community, right? So I just think that's what I would say. The one other thing I would say, and this is, um, I think rural America is the essential worker for the rest of America. And so I think rural as a whole is underutilized or undervalued and underutilized as a resource. Just a few small things, Andrew. Thanks. Um, and uh, you unwittingly, or maybe in completely wittingly, uh, set us up for our next um, question here, um, which was, which I want to direct to, to Heidi and Joy. Um, and Heidi, we'll start with you and then and then turn to Joey on this one. Um, so Janet mentioned one thing in this realm, which is hard to measure, things that are hard to measure, hard to identify, hard to quantify, right? Um, so she was talking specifically about rural development hubs as a very specific, important kind of organization. Um, but I want to ask you about that. So, so thinking about these kind of assets and you know the people and the doers and the leaders that we just discussed, what are some of the difficulties you face working in communities with communities in identifying, quantifying, and showcasing rural assets? And how might this typology and dashboard help with that? And on the flip side, you know, what are those things that a tool like this that is inherently quantitative in nature are just never going to be able to get to? So how can this help? And what are sort of its, its limitations? Oh. Um, th thanks, Andrew. I, I think, first of all, I would just say I absolutely applaud this tool um, and the, the development of it and any tool that is working for us to increase access to rural data, um, and measurements. Um, we know rural is underfunded. Um, it's 97% of our land area, 19% of our population, and philanthropically, only 6% of funding goes there. So the, the, the resources are super rare and, um, and <laughs> coveted, I will just say, when you do rural development initiative or rural development work. Um, and one of the things that has been difficult in, in the matter is that 
Every rural place needs to do this. Every rural place needs to start with an asset map, needs to have these measurements, and it's expensive and hard and unavailable to get that data. So just first of all, I would say the existence of this tool in and of itself answers a difficulty, that, which is disaggregated rural data is rare. I, I, every presentation I go to, the number one thing I said is, do you disaggregate that by rural? Can we understand the rural problem? So that's the first thing. Do we, do we overall understand the rural problem and then the rural solutions and the rural impacts that are then those solutions are having? It's hard. This gives us an opportunity to do that. Um, and that's hard. Um, the, when you, when you, um, when you think about, like I work in the Pacific Northwest, so I serve Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. There are 340 rural places in, or in Oregon alone, 340 rural places. There's 11 urban. So like you, you think about every one of those rural places and the local people that we talk so highly, Joy talks so highly about, I talk so highly about, they, they actually don't have a difficulty understanding their assets. They know what they are. There's not a difficulty understanding it. The difficulty for me is every single one of those 340 places needs to help, needs to help uncovering those and, and recognizing them and understanding how they work together and um, how they interplay. So tools like the tool that, uh, that was demonstrated, thank you, is that they show um, some of the more uh, um, uh, required, that's the word I'm going to use. <laughs> Sorry, I almost got jaded and cynical there. Required um, measurements like financial measurements that where our grants and our, our work we requ are required to show a return on investment, usually in financial terms. It puts it side by side with um, I would say measures that are more meaningful to the community itself as it thinks about um, how it's going to move forward from where they are to making a more vital community for themselves. Um, so that I, I think, I think one of the other thing that's really frustrating and difficult related to some of the data that was mentioned is just the, the long, uh, Joyce, it's about time, right? It's about time um, that we saw rural differently and stopped the narrative that is destructive. It's, it's simplifying. It's not, it doesn't even come close to representing the diversity and the cultural aspects of rural. And so I think um, there's a difficulty in those, for those organizations that serve rural to um, be, be uplifting that and showing that without having it compared to that of rural or of urban places where it's it's just a different ecosystem, right? And it's not less than, and anyway, I just, I think that there's something about the difficulty in sharing, uplifting and highlighting the diversity in our places. Um, but overall, I would say rural, when I go into a rural place and I do an asset map, it's the most fun thing to do. And they eat it up like candy. They, they get it, they understand it, they know how to use it. Um, and this tool will only become something I hope um, that gets used for their benefit. So I, guess it's my, I guess it's my turn. Um, and I have construction going on around my house. So I want to apologize for the background noise. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to kind of expand on what Heidi was mentioning is um, I'm going to come from the educational institution standpoint. I represent an 1890 land grant and trying to find a resource to go to a data set that talks about the positive is far and few between. I can find data on the poverty and how many people are low and living below poverty, housing issues, age, demographics. I can learn about sex, um, looking at age and how certain things with regards to joblessness, homelessness, mental addiction, obesity, every negative thing that you can possibly think of, there is a data set for it. And it's okay when we're going after competitive funding, because one of the key things that I try to do is try to get some of this competitive funding into rural parts of the state. But isn't it about time that when we submit a proposal or when we're engaging an audience like this, that even though those negative things exist, there's some great things to also complement it. And one of the things that I like about this data tool is that it gives you, um, a, a, a snapshot of where it all is. 
Um, so yes, I'm in Georgia, but I fall into that sexy hot pink category and all from, it looks like North Carolina swooping all the way through Texas. They're like my cousins. We all have some of the same great things going on, even though we have high poverty, we have bankruptcy, we have obesity. Yes, we are the fattest people in the country, but guess what? Our cultural um, aspects, the healthcare aspects, you can't touch us. And so it's, this tool kind of gives me and hopefully others some bragging rights that we didn't have before. Um, so I don't want to spend too long bragging on being hot pink, um, but we are a force to be reckoned with. And those that are in the blues and the greens and the yellows, we like you and we appreciate what you're known for, but we've got something that you don't have. And this tool really allows us to just brag on ourselves. So um, that's what I just kind of want to hit on from on that without getting in trouble with the moderator. You never get in trouble with me. And I don't know if you picked that shirt on purpose, but it looks kind of hot pink. So I think you're representing. Um, so, and I just want to say, you know, I, I was uh, lucky enough to be involved um, with Courtney and the team on this. And I, you know, I want to be explicit for everybody on this webinar that um, there was very intentional approach of not saying better or worse. Right. I mean, the green's not better than the pink, it's not better than the orange and the yellow. Like, it, we're just putting the data out there and we're very intentional about not saying this is good and this is bad, um, or this asset is better than this asset. Um, so, hopefully, that, you know, that came through, uh, but that was very intentional. Now, Janet, I want to turn to you and something that both Heidi and Joy, and I think you mentioned earlier, uh, but you know, the recency effect, um, I remember theirs uh, most acutely, they both mentioned was this idea of narrative and story and the story that is told about rural places. And in some rural places, it, you know, some sort of adopted that um, narrative that other people have attached to them. But um, this idea of not just talking about what's wrong with a place. Um, now, as you well know, and as they both acknowledge just now, too often in community and economic development and policy making more generally, we focus on a community's deficits rather than its assets. Now, why does highlighting rural assets matter? How does that change what we do? Yeah. So I'm still I'm still getting over the hot pink and I'm thinking that, you know, a year from now, everyone uh, like like zodiac signs, everyone say, what color are you on the map? You know, and so Corianne, you can look forward to that. Um, uh, so here's why. Here's why I think, you know, you have to focus on assets because, it, you know, when when people measure rural or development success, rural or urban, you know, they often talk about jobs and money, you know, like investment, da, 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 da. It's all about, in many ways, except for the jobs, and it's not necessarily jobs or whom or whatever, it's about dollars, right? And and I often, you know, when when we were working with the community capitals a few few years back, trying to explain why you needed to focus on all eight capitals, and I'm with Heidi, the individual capital is separate and intellectual capital is separate, uh, along with the others, you, you have to say, well, what, what, why all of these capitals? Why is this important? And, and what I started doing is putting a slide up that had a big bag of money in the middle of a room. And I said, okay, if all we care about is financial capital as defining success, right? If I put that bag in the middle of the room and I close the door and I come back a year from now, nothing else will have happened. It does not turn into something by itself. It is the other assets, right? That use financial capital as well as all the other capitals in order to create what we call development. So we really need to look 
stop measuring things mostly using financial measures or dollar measures because it's the other capitals that make a difference in whether something happens and whether something happens to improve lives, whether something happens to decrease inequality, whether something happens to, to you know, build wealth for more people, for more widespread wealth. And so I think it's really important to look at all the assets. That's number one. Number two, so a wider range. Number two, if you start with assets, it changes what the conversation is about, right? What's the conversation you want to have in your community, right? And quite often, the conversation starts with what is wrong. And that, that happens in community. It happens in systems as well. Just look at the media narrative coverage of rural. It mainly focuses on what is wrong, except for acute feature piece now and then, right? Not on what is right. So do you want, if you're trying to improve the, the, the future, are you gonna start with woe is me or are you gonna start with possibility? And possibility is better. And you realize possibility more when you focus at the beginning of a conversation about what do we have, right? And, and so, you know, I have, I have witnessed in recent years different organizations trying to I would say, make that switch. So um, uh, Nebraska, the Nebraska Community Foundation, which is working with like hundreds of communities in their state to sort of really figure out what they want to do to make their place better. They said, let's hit the dream switch, right? Hit the dream switch, right? Not the need switch. Uh, another one is this, uh, the um, Black Belt Community Foundation, which their motto is take what we have to make what we need, right? In other words, we have something and we can use what we have to make what we need and 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 another one and i heard this from a, uh, an amazing parent uh, of a low-income family who basically said stop thinking about what i don't have meet me where i dream right and so we have to start the conversation with assets it, it's just going to get you further and and i will say this also because it's clear to me that money and investment flows to energy not to need Right. And, and I've said this before, this is not new, but it's observable over, you know, you know, uh, my career of like nearly 40 years that when all anyone talks about is, you know, the, the high percentage of their free, uh, free and re reduced school lunch, and therefore we are poorer than the neighbors next door give us the money. That's not where the investment goes. It goes where someone has tried something, whether they've succeeded or failed. And so I think it's really important to have an asset frame as the base for your development, thinking and doing. And that asset approach helps. And so I think this tool is a real conversation starter because it helps you look at your place and say, okay, look at what we do have. Yeah, there, there's this other stuff, but look at what we do have, right? What can we do with it? Thanks for that. Um, so uh, Heidi and Joy, um, again, working in and with rural communities uh, on the ground, very hands-on way. Um, how does highlighting rural assets matter? And how, how do you do that in the conversations that you're having with rural community leaders, whether they're policymakers, funders, or others whose decisions affect access to opportunity in the communities you work in? Um, you know, Joy, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, sort of the, the, the problem data I'll call it, um, is something that everybody asks for, you know, in the grant application, right? What's your poverty rate? You know, how disadvantaged is your community? Um, are you worse off than your neighbor? Um, are you having conversations with these folks about assets? You know, are you seeing any shift? Are there some folks that get it, some that don't? Sort of how, how is that conversation around assets happening in your communities? How would you like it to be happening? Um, explore that for me. And Joy, I'll start with you. Yay, hot pink. Um, one of the things that I will say is that when we are looking at attracting industry uh, to our state, unfortunately, those of you who are not from Georgia, I apologize, but you would start to believe there's only like 
three or four main cities in Georgia, and you guys can name them. Atlanta being number one, Savannah, Athens, I'm missing something, Augusta, and I'm gonna throw in Columbus just for fun. And you, the folks are missing the boat. When you start looking at access to rail, when you start looking at access to roads, airport, moving product from state to state or from top to bottom, those main assets, and I love infrastructure. I'm, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm gonna leave that alone. People sleep on how we get our products and the routes that they have to take to get from point A to point B. Um, yeah, we talk a lot about the problem assets, but if your community doesn't have uh, rail, uh, roads, bridges, airport, and I feel like I'm missing one because I get nervous, but just bear with me. Um, most of those assets, yes, they are in the big metropolitan cities, but those rail lines come straight through rural Georgia. Um, they help get our products out of rural Georgia to urban parts of the state and even to the international landscape. A lot of us are sleeping on the fact that what we have in our rural community, I always plug my rural farmers, those products are not only going to urban parts of the state, but they're going all over our country and they're going abroad. You can't get better watermelons and peaches than from rural parts of the state. <laughs> um, so, and to the first part of your question, Andrew, who else is bragging on rural assets? That's not something you see in Newsweek or on Time or on social media. We're always talking about what's wrong. Like we're just, I don't know, aliens. I live in rural Georgia and I look great. So we've got to have some type of tool in place. And that's why I commend the Urban Institute where we can just take pride in what we have. I mean, it may not be on a postcard, um, but some of the best festivals that you ever are gonna experience occur in rural parts of the country. I'll sit on a panel with Joy and Janet any day. I just want you to know that, Andrew, anytime you want to pull this together. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go grassroots. I am a, um, I'm a rural kid and the daughter of rural, rural grassroots leaders, and I'm going to go real grassroots on, on why this is important and why focusing on rural assets are, are, are um, is important and to build upon what Janet said um, about how you start I've, I've been doing this work for 23 years and for the first couple of years of my existence I would, would go out and I would talk to people and they I would you know ask them about their community and and I just don't think I would have made it many more years <laughs> if I if I kept having those conversations without some of the tools about uh, questions about what's going right and what's um, what do you have that's working and what what do you have to build from because it is um, it is really easy for not only the outside to focus on the negative, but also the inside. And RDI runs a rural community leadership program with the, with the emphasis on building grassroots and local people who are integrated in their own community better and are working to have skills to work together and get involved and make change. And I just want to even put forth uh, an example of one of the things we do. So with this broad, we have 30 people in the room, and these are from 16-year-olds to 84s, from, from youth to, to experienced leaders, and most of them are just kind of this, what we call emerging leader sort of perspective. And what we do is we create an asset map uh, using these capitals with sticky notes, right? And everyone just writes all the assets on it, and they meet, you know, within 15 minutes, you can have a full asset map of your community it's not technical or anything like that. But what we do then is we then have the participants grab randomly some assets and they have a group and they have a um, competition to see if they can create a project with these six random assets. And just can you create a project or get something done? And the innovation that happens when this group starts from what they have and the projects that they can create, they're always fairly viable projects and they can get them done without funding, without permission. Well, not always without permission, but mostly without permissions from 
I always say, unless the first we have ODOT here, Oregon Department of, of Transportation, which is not an unfriendly organization. That's not what I'm saying. But you don't ask to ask permission um, from them or kind of create a change of the road or um, pass legislation. Anyways, it's empowering to those community members who are if human capital, and I believe this, and social capital, the, the most foundational for those people to get involved, they it's not only about whether we invest in it from the outside, it's whether those people are going to invest in their community from the inside. And they're motivated by, oh, look, I can see things that I can get done, that I care about, that I can use what we have. And so I think focusing on the assets uh, is important in that way. I'm going to put an exclamation point on one of the things that Janet said, and as a longtime frustration of, of mine, and I tend to get, I'm now jaded, I'm old, so I'm jaded now about some things, and I am just a little over the fact that, it, that the only capitals we seem to be able to focus on and the only worth we can, can see with rural communities from the outside perspective is what rural can do for us um, as a whole and, and, and also what financial measures there are without the understanding that to put into play some of these foundational capitals is imperative to get to those points where those, uh, where those financial um, gains will happen. We have to invest in these foundational things. And even the most sophisticated funders and, and agencies that we have still ask for very traditionally, um, what I will call now shallow, fairly shallow uh, measurement. So I, I hope that what happens is that by seeing the value of rural places in more colors than just hot pink, in, in many different colors from many different facets, that we, we can understand that for rural, it's really about the community as a whole and not just what we can use out of the natural or how we can build financial. It is, it is more than that. It is very, very important for us to focus on the other capitals and building them and ask even for that in reporting. So Andrew, can I, can I kick in for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. From, well, I, I'll leave that to Andrew to answer. No, go for it. Please. You, you know, when, when Heidi talked about getting people in a room and having them look at the capitals and then write down, you know, what are the assets we have relation to this capital and then make that connection about how can I put five together and make something happen that needs to happen. That's the job of development, right? We think of economic development as business recruitment or whatever. What she's talking about is the job of development, but it is not how we train people to do development in rural or or anywhere really and that that is really you know it's it is once again taking what we have to make what we need and realizing what where what our starting point is and moving from that starting point understanding starting points is very important and i want to say and, and 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 like having having the space to figure out what can we do on our own and what do we need to change out there in other systems in order to facilitate what we know we need to do in our community and that's where i get to to what joy said She's, she's loud and proud and that's great. And, and rural needs to be loud and proud, right? And, and, and make these points to the systems. And, and I think about this in relation to assets too, because there's a terrific, some of you know her, a terrific um, economic development district uh, leader in, in Minnesota, in rural Minnesota, Staples, Minnesota named um, Cheryl Lee Hills. And, and whenever she uh, reports to a funder or to government on the measures they want, you know, she adds the measures she thinks make a difference, right? In other words, not the ones they asked for. And they said, well, we didn't ask for these. She said, I know, but they are important to us and to making progress. And so on some level, she is using the reporting process as a teachable moment to the resource providers, whether it's federal or state government, to foundations saying, you want these measures, but they're not as important for getting ahead as these other measures. So start paying attention. And I think that more of rural has to raise their voice on what those things are mm -hmm. without being asked. Andrew, you know, there's one other thing I want to say without getting in trouble it is also with this tool, it is highlighting communities people didn't even know about. We are now asking now, where is that? Oh, wow. I didn't really, 
they have that there? I need to go check that place out. So that's another great thing about this tool. Like, and I'm using my state. It's not highlighting those common known cities. I swear we have more than five cities in Georgia. I promise. And this tool highlights not all of the rural communities, but communities that probably would never get a spotlight because they just don't fit the mold. I'm glad that it's doing that, Joy. Um, and that is one of the big reasons, actually, that um, it's rural specific and, you know, the urban areas that are grayed out, you know, and we focus in on how these places are similar um, without sort of urban pull, pulling places in to have peers that actually aren't their peers, you know. Um, so now I want to follow up on something that I think you've all touched on a little bit here, um, which is this great work and how focusing on assets can change a conversation and get people energized and yet seems to still be the exception to the rule of what funders are asking you to report on, what seems to be important to you know, the powers that be or whomever that is. Um, not the people in the community. I mean, they care about assets. You know, some of them need to be led there, but once you get into a room and you start talking about assets, everybody gets excited, right? Um, so why is that, right? So why are we still measuring the wrong things? Is it because it's easier, right? I mean, is this tool something that can help with that? Obviously it has its limitations, but why are folks still asking for the wrong measures? And, and, you know, we had a conversation about this with the EDA and the USDA um, recently around measures and helping them shift their thinking on measures. So why is it that you think we're still measuring the wrong things? And are there any examples uh, you know, over the course of your career, have you seen a shift in what folks are asking for and a shift to more asset-based stuff as opposed to just who's the most disadvantaged? But I would be interested in, in those two. So why are we measuring the wrong things and are we starting to shift more to this asset-based approach? Um, and uh, Heidi, I'll, I'll start with you and, and then Joy and Janet. I'm the wrong person to ask the question why. I, I'm the jaded one in the corner, right? Um, I, I feel like that what I will say is I, I think it's just because that's what we traditionally have done and what we have valued. And what I am hopeful about is that, so RDI creates an impact report every quarter and we measure that throughout the year and we're measuring the capitals for our own work and we feed that back to a group of our funders um, over time. I also, I'm, I'm here at this conversation today. I am in conversations with funders all across my region and across the nation and talking about rural and I being asked these questions. And so what gives me a little bit of, a, of hope in my jaded corner is that when I when we speak and when we say things like this, it's now being listened to, and I've, I'm watching now programs be created in from philanthropy or supported from philanthropy and others that are new. And I'm I'm watching um, the rural is it the rural partnership project is that what it's called or like that particular element where it's we're we're going to invest in capacity building, we are going to invest in the, the very intellectual and support and human capital that a, a community needs. So I'm watching, I'm watching a shift and I don't want to make that seem small because from the 40 years of Janet's work, the 23 years of your, I don't know, Joy, how long you've been here, but it feels, it feels really monumental that we are, are now understanding that kind of these foundational capacities, these capacities that we haven't, we've undervalued in the past 
are really important in the development work. So I guess while I am saying, like, like why we're saying we don't do it yet, I think we're at a, uh, here's the word of the year or last year, pivotal moment where I do actually think that that's changing. What I know about change is that the pressure has to be on to keep it. And it is the old way wants to come back really hard where we just measure jobs and we just measure household income and we just kind of measure the top, the grass top of it all versus really measuring, are we putting in the infrastructure, both both physical um, and emotional and human capital that is is kind of in there that we are we can build from in order to get to the top of that and what we what we really do want yes I I want jobs too I don't, that I do want I just think we have to build them from a level of foundation that's that's deeper in the grass than we think it is and Andrew I. And I, and I think I heard you correctly. You said, are folks asking for the wrong thing? I don't want to misquote you and get in trouble. On the wrong measure. So, right, you know, all people care about is, you know, did you create a job? I don't care what the wage is. I don't care who got it. But, you know, how many jobs can I check box sort of thing versus, you know, investing in leaders, investing in capacity, investing in assets, the sort of things well, that are I deeper than just, is there a job? Well, you know, and I, and I don't want to get kicked off the panel like midway through. Um, I made it this far, but some of this is political and I know we don't like to talk about things like that. That is a really bad word, but um, there are some preconceived notions out there that I think are driven by things that go on in DC and wherever your capital may be that drive the questions or the numbers that people want. And I, representing an educational institution, I see myself as an educator that when these questions are being asked, I take it as my responsibility to say, hey, wait a minute, there's some other things that you're missing. I know you think the unemployment rate and the high school dropout rate is what's gonna change the world. And at one point in time, we were talking about teen pregnancy rates and, and things of that nature. I guess we're not doing that anymore. Um, I don't think folks are asking for the wrong thing. They just kind of go with things that are familiar with to them. And what makes them feel good, if that makes sense, and it's something that they can wrap their arms around. And I think it's our role, not just Heidi, Joy, and Janet, and Corianne and others, to educate our audience and the people who are in elected positions to say, hey, there's more than ABCD, whatever their ABCD is. So it's a uh, all hands on deck. It takes a village to raise a child. We've all got to pull our weight in educating those that are in, power, in positions of power to think broader, um, and really start drilling down on some of the assets that are spotlighted and highlighted within this tool. Yeah, okay. quick, quickly, so Andrew. I just want to know, um, we're about, after Janet, we're going to pose one last quick question because we're getting past time, so we're having a great conversation. But uh, I just want to say, um, before we get there, after I let Janet close us out on this one, I want to remind folks that we're going to be heading to audience Q&A soon. So drop your questions in the box. So Janet. Yeah, I mean, the answer to your question, Andrew, which is why do we still, why, why we still ask for these measures is because there, there's a data issue. Where is there data that can be aggregated, that's easy to get, that can be aggregated across place for comparison. And so that's what a lot of government wants Right. And there are political reasons for that. And, you know, some measures, jobs is always a great measure to talk about. Right. But it's also where is their data collected? Is it easy? Is it comparative? Can it be aggregated across place? Now, taking her her phrase that, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. It actually takes a village to raise a village. Right. And so here's an interesting thing. If you think about children or you think about a friend that you have that wants to create something. Think about kids in school. We have grades and we have test scores and we have all those other things. But anyone who's raised a child or knows a child knows that sometimes 
you that child's success or that young person's or your friend's success depends on a challenge they have for themselves. I'm going to feel better about myself if I'm able to run a mile in six months, if I'm able to do this, if I learn to play chess, if I, you know, uh, you know, can play in the band. I mean, there are different kinds of challenges that we give ourselves as people and as communities and progress on those is much more important to future momentum and success than something like how much money I make, right? Or the, uh, you know, whether I got that grade in school. And so we have to think of communities that way too and negotiate measures, right? What's an important measure for our community now at our starting point over the next year? And that may or may not be a number of new jobs. It may be what you have to do now in order to create jobs three years from now. And that's really got to be acknowledged. And what gets measured over time? Yeah, you can have some comp comparable measures, but you also have to have some measures that are specific to individual, individual communities that are negotiated with resource providers and with yourself, your own community. Thank you. Um, so uh, we're a couple of minutes past. I'm just going to skip my closing question. As great as it was, uh, I'd rather put that aside and uh, answer what our participants uh, are interested in, because uh, that's more important. Um, so uh, the first question is, uh, how can rural localities, and Joy, this is something that you brought up in our uh, prep call, um, who may be less experienced or have less capacity at compiling and utilizing data, become more knowledgeable in using uh, a tool like this to showcase your assets? Now that's a trick question. You know you've got to go to your local in your uh, local institution, cooperative extension, of course, to the rescue. We are in all fifty states, but of course, you know Georgia has, you know. I'm not gonna go there, but all, all, with all seriousness, that's what our post-secondary institutions, I think one of the key roles is helping people to understand, not only understand, but find it, and then being able to translate. Um, I will say with this tool here, it is much more friendly than I think going to the census website and trying to find some information, because if you have not played on the census website, you have not lived. Um, but I really would say that for those who are less experienced, please ro uh, reach out to your post-secondary institutions. And if you do have an extension program, um, those are typically at your 1862, 1890s, and 1994s. Um, they have researchers and educators that are dedicated and they live and breathe this stuff and they love it, i.e. me. <laughs> And maybe one day we'll invest in organizations to have that capacity. Uh, Heidi, you wanna? Yeah, I, um, it, I, I just, we had here in Oregon, the Oregon, Oregon State University had a tool for a while, I think it still stood up called Rural Community Explorer, which helped our, our communities here in Oregon understand their data and be data driven. But the, there's a question in the chat that's, that's similar and it's from Jacob, Jacob Wildfire and it's, he's quest, asking a question about, coming to government grant programs and having the capacity to, uh, does this tool help in that way? Um, I, I think, you know, like you, we have, we, we added teaching about the Rural Community Explorer and now I encourage myself, like we need to figure out how to add using this tool into our curriculum to be, to be, to be training that sort of leader in our community that is using data and using assets and using it in a way that's pretty accessible um, still, still should be added into a conversation if you're in, working in groups. But I feel like a tool is only as good as, as we use it, as, as the amount of times we use it. And, and Joy, I, I would say go to Extension if it's there, but also it's, it's in all 50 states, but it's not in all 340 communities. And so it's really important to, I think, make sure that the trusted, and I don't, the trusted a the trusted people are teaching this to use this tool, um, and we as developers are 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 I aware of that this tool exists, we're aware of tools like these exist, and are using them and introducing them to the local people who ultimately end up doing the work and are you know they're going to be there 
when everything else is gone, the people are going to be there. So um, I, th I think that's true. And I think that's true for nonprofit organizations as well related to Jacob's question. Um, I do think it helps, but I think it's important that you recognize that those are those are some of the institutions that I'm cynical about and you know worried that it still doesn't, they're still asking really, really hard questions um, to answer um, and show impact in over time. So I, I would say one other thing that no matter what tool you use, this one or another one, that making local meaning is critical. I mean, there, there, you know, there, there is a, you know, measure in this tool and not being critical, Coriana, on housing quality that makes it look like housing quality across rural America looks pretty good. And uh, I think we all know that's not the case, but that's the fault of what data is available. It's not the fault of the analysis, you know. And so uh, whenever we have done data reports, pulling data from other things for a community or a region, what we do is sort of come up with a few measures and then we put them around and say, okay, make meaning about this, make meaning of this data for us. Because often, you know, you're, you're bucking conventional wisdom. I mean, one of the wonderful things about this tool is you could put it in front of a community or a set of census tracts and the people from those tracts and say, and they'll find out that something they thought was true about them is not, that they thought things were worse than they are. And that's always wonderful. Um, but then you'll find there's some weird thing and they can explain why that piece of data is weird and how it was a historic anomaly and it's no longer true. So people can't just accept data. They have to look at it and analyze it. And that, I mean, it's really important, right? Yeah, and uh, there's another question that I think gets to that, um, which is how do we capture assets not adequately measured by this tool. And we know sometimes, you know, this tool measures some things, it doesn't measure everything. It's important, there are other measures that you could bring in, but again, they're measures. Inherently, some things are not, that are important are not quantifiable, uh, are not quantifiable in a way that, you know, is gonna be consistent or meaningful. Um, so how do we measure those things? And I just want to mention, because I have my soapbox here, um, and people have the people on the thing have to listen to me. But I mean, we decide what we measure, right? I mean, like BLS gets a bunch of money to measure jobs, and there are people that work in counties and states all over the country who get paid to sit around and measure how many jobs there are. You know, I mean, we could make an investment and having better data on other things in rural areas. So that, that's a choice that we make as a society. So it's not, that is not a given, that is something that we have decided. So I don't, I don't want us to accept that we have to accept that reality. But uh, anyways, th what is not, cannot be measured that we, is important that we need to be thinking about and how can folks out there uh, get at those things? Yeah, I'll start with one. Okay. Um, and we did a whole session uh, in in collegiality with the Federal Reserve Board and Housing Assistance Council and RCAP and uh, Rolisk a few weeks ago on what is capacity, right? Because we always talk about that we need more capacity in rural. And by the end of the conversation, it came down to relationships, right? <laughs> it had to do the, with the relationships to make change. Well, you know, you don't report that necessarily to funder, although you could. And I, I, I'll give you a story here. Uh, many years ago, I was working with a very small community in, in Montana, uh, you know, a place you would not have heard of. And they were trying to build a local endowment, right? A community endowment so they could invest in themselves over time. And they were just starting. And I talked to these three guys. They, it, was, it was a small team group. And I sent them off to a corner and say, okay, in six months, how would you measure that you had made progress? And they took their hour to come up with it. When they came back, the other communities had, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And this one community said, our measure is Louise. And I said, what, what's that? And basically, they figured if by the end of six months, Louise contributed to the endowment, then everyone else in the community would say it's okay. And that, that would unleash everyone else from doing it. Louise was the measure, right? So that's a relationship, right? 
and it's momentum. And so I think these things have to be solved. And this is a true story. I'm not making this up. The name may be wrong. My memory's going, but you know, it was Louise, right? And so how those are measures you have to create for yourself on what energy and momentum would look like. And usually they come down to some change in relationship. And I just want to take this moment to plug that Aspen did come out with a measuring community capacity building uh, workbook um, some years ago that is uh, it was pretty great and helps measure um, things that are hard to measure. So Ooh, I'll find it, put that, put it on the website. Just a minute. Yeah. I would answer this question very similarly. I think that it has to do with our know-how about how we work together. How can we work together and get things done? And, and quite honestly, right now in our in our culture and our communities, some of that has to do with can we have civil conversations even? So it's it's, got, it's gotten harder, I think, in some ways to work together to get things done. Um, so I would put that there. Jen, Janet mentioned at the beginning of this those those organizations that are in community who are getting things done. And I, I would say it goes from grassroots leaders who are taking on individual things to, to those organizations taking on, can you measure the more sophisticated kind of projects and efforts and energies that they're taking on? Because it, um, it can go from pre pretty simple, like we're gonna put a pollinators garden, garden in downtown to we're creating a community center that highlights the culture and creates um, creates a place for entrepreneurship and creates a, uh, a place for visitors to attract, but also puts a center in our, in our community in a way that we haven't had before. And all of a sudden you've got multiple different facets of things going on and, and they're, they can a group get together and, and pull that one off and, or can they um, come together and solve a problem like grazing on federal lands um, in a way that keeps community together and doesn't destroy um, the social and capital and community capitals that are, that are in place. So I, I do think that there's the kind of, I don't know if it's hard to measure like the sophistication of projects when it's getting into these more moving from simple to complex or complicated to complex issues. And when communities are taking on complex systems oriented things, you're at a whole different level of intellectual or what I would call community capital. So just, I think that's hard to measure. And I, I think it matters as we help build the capacity of local people to get things done in their own community. And, and the only thing that I would say, and it's because I am a transplant from the East Coast coming down to the South, is culture, tradition, and the role of the family unit in how things are done and how important it is in the foundation of the communities that we serve. Um, none of that can be measured. And it is so, so important. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna spend too long on this bandwagon, but culture and tradition in the South, you are not gonna change it. And certain things are gonna happen like clockwork, um, regardless of what's going on around, outside, on top, on the bottom. Um, it's so, so important. The type of buildings, the, the type of businesses, um, what gets people to go out and vote, all stems, there's some backstory that can't be measured, but has to be known, in my opinion, in order for certain things to happen. Um, in a community, in a region, and in this country. Thank you, Joy. And I am afraid we are at time here, and I'm looking at the Q&A, um, and there's so many great questions in there that I'm just devastated that we're not going to be able to get the wisdom of these uh, three folks on. Uh, so I apologize if you submitted a question we weren't able to get to it. Uh, but I want to thank Heidi and Joy and Janet for joining me in this great conversation and to Corianne and the whole team at Urban for inviting us uh, to have it. And I will turn it over to Corianne to close us out. I'll just reiterate the thanks um, to our wonderful panelists. Thank you, Andrew, for moderating this discussion. Thanks for um, the great questions from the audience. Um, and yeah, we're sad we couldn't get to all of the great questions that were asked. 
Uh, we do maybe, hope maybe that you can save them and we'll, we'll answer them later or something. Well, We'll, we'll, we'll definitely capture them, absolutely, and see right. if we can circle back. Um, but we just thank everyone for joining us today on behalf of the Urban Institute um, and our speakers and panelists. Uh, we'll drop a link into the chat uh, to a survey that you can fill out for us just quickly. Tell us your thoughts on the event. Um, it always helps us do better next time. Uh, if there is a better, I, I humbly think that you all were fantastic and really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with us today. So thanks everyone and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.